So you can all hear me well? Yes. Cool. I'll get you to start off. Um, just close your eyes, open your mind. I want you to think, oh, what happened there? <laughs> I want you to think about the enthusiasm of young minds, people who are enthusiastic about learning, um, the wanting to find out how things work, see if they can make things work themselves. And then I want you to start thinking about having free access to tools and technology, being able to find the tools, information that you need to be able to do to be able to learn and make things happen. And then I want you to think about people with knowledge to share, people who are prepared to give information to other people to see them learn and grow. Now I want you to think about the possibilities of putting all that together. Having the young minds, the tools and the knowledge that people have to share. What can you, have, what can you get from that? Possibilities of doing that are endless. So as before, as mentioned, um, my name's Ian. I'm talking about the Catalyst Open Source Academy. Um, email address and you'll just about find me on most of the social media thingies as I Beardsley. We'll start off with um, people with knowledge to share. Catalyst IT, um, we have 130 odd staff throughout the world pretty much, uh, based in Wellington, Sydney and Brighton. We've been going off, we've been working for over 10 years and we've been regular sponsors of LCA. This year we did things slightly different. We had a few people from outside Catalyst help us. Um, Brenda Wallace, um, Dr. Brenda Chawner from Victoria University School of Information Management. And just hold for a sec there. Um, she, we brought her in to talk about her thesis she did, which was factors influencing participation satisfaction with free and open source software projects. And we had Ka Chan from Victoria University School of Design. He came in and did a presentation on Blender. We don't have anyone on our staff who knows that. Andrew McMillan from Morphus came in and did some stuff with us as well. And also this year, Where's My Server, um, we're able to provide virtual machines, virtual servers, for our students to actually be able to do stuff in the outside world. Previously, um, we had our own virtual machines internally that they couldn't access from outside. Okay, tools and technologies. A massive long list. We found, thought about just about everything we would possibly use. Perl, Git, Ubuntu, Blender, PHP, GIMP, Python, Inkscape, Java, Apache, Postgres, Copyright, Android, HTML, CSS, jQuery, and using the shell. As you can see, there's so much we can be teaching people. There's so much that's available to learn. Enthusiastic young minds. We're targeting high school students um, in the last two years of school, years 12 and 13. They do have a range of skills and knowledge. Some people who had never played with technology much, they hadn't done a lot of um, computing, and some people were pretty much guns at it. It was interesting to note as we were interviewing people for the academy that um, we're asking them what open source tools they'd, programs they'd used. There were a number of them that said they hadn't used any until we said, well, do you use Firefox, do you use Mozilla, um, do you use Thunderbird, and you know, People just weren't aware those were open source. 2011, um, we aimed for 10 students. Catalyst is an organisation where if we find good people, um, let's use them, let's make things happen for them. So although we targeted 10, we ended up picking the 17 people. This year, we are aimed for 20 and we got 23. The Academy was came about because of the, um, the lack of women in technology and what we wanted to do was try and catch the young women coming through school who may not have been exposed to technology too much and see if we can get them more interested. 2011 we had 8 out of the 17 and this year we have 6 out of the 23 and it is possible that right now they are actually watching the streaming presentation. I might go back to the mouse at some stage. Week one, mostly learning. We were, we have thrown a lot at them. In one week, we're trying to teach them 
a whole bunch of stuff that you'd probably learn at a polytech or at a university over a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so. We're trying to jam a whole bunch into the one week. Week one for last year, getting them to install their own Ubuntu laptop. We teach them about, a bit about freedom and understanding what licenses, copyright, Creative Commons, what that's all about, how the web works. Some people haven't come from an understanding of technology too much, so we make sure they understand how things work. Um, the most excitement that happened with that one was one of the, the tutors showing them how to use Netcat to send email. Um, one of the parents was most amused by some of the emails he got. Then we have um, a presentation on my first server, basically taking a virtual machine, securing it, using SSH keys to make sure you can lock it down quite nicely. But about HTML, CSS, we're starting to get into some of the um, making things, seeing things happen. Databases, we covered Postgres rather than MySQL because Catalyst uses Postgres. And ultimately, if we can get people trained up right, we've got more students, more potential employees coming along. PHP, Git, Perl, that was an interesting one. Um, one of our people described uh, Perl as child abuse. <laughs> and graphics. Week two, mostly, uh, sorry, this year's. Week one, week one. Pretty much the same sort of thing, except um, we dropped the Perl and did Python. And we also added Blender. Week two, mostly projects. We can't jam absolutely everything into one week. So we need to be able to add a little bit more class stuff into the second week. Community, how to work with the community. Uh, basic rule generally is don't be a jerk. Session on that, we did some QA, some testing stuff with them, um, test driven development. Project work, I'll come back to a bit more detail on that. We took them for a class trip to Weta. They got to see their server room, have a look at all the big machines. And we finished on the Friday with Tokemon. Tokemon is a um, KiwiCon invention, basically a whole bunch of test, uh, virtual servers that uh, you get tokens for getting particular hacks on, finding information about the machines. That was probably a little bit too, too high level for what we're aiming with the students. Week two of this year, just one day of extra learning, same sort of thing, we cut down the git from the full half day to just a small session to uh, yesterday. Java for Android was yesterday afternoon and now they should be busy doing project work. Week two, ultimate goal with the um, academy, we want to be able to see students get a commit onto a public project. Something that at the end of the academy, they can go away and say, this is what I did. And then later on when they go for a job or applying for university and people say, how good are you? They can say, well, look, this is what I've done. The world can see the code I've done. Didn't always work like that, unfortunately. So the projects. Koha was probably the most um, enthusiastic um, project we had. Um, Koha is a library system, open source, um, started off at the Horofenwell Library in Levin um, and has now grown to be pretty much one of the biggest open source library systems used all over the world. Unfortunately, probably not as much as it should be in New Zealand. Did it last year, um, unit tests, seven modules had a hell of a lot of, of unit tests added to their repertoire. And this year they're working on a dashboard, so an admin dashboard so that the um, librarians can see statistics of what's happening in libraries out, books out, etc. Kiritaki Koha is an Android app for accessing Koha. So this is a um, first time we've done some Android stuff with students. Uh, we've had the application, Catalyst has had this application for a while and um, it sort of hasn't had a lot of attention and we're now just trying to give a little bit more a little bit more functionality, give it a better user experience. Mahara, we did that last year, um, an e-portfolio system. Drupal, last year and this year. Problem with Drupal, I think, for within the goals of the academy, it does actually um, 
create a few more challenges to actually get code committed. Koha was very easy because Chris Cormack was the release manager last year, which was able to make sure code was getting through nice and quick. We did a CPAN module, um, very heavy into the pool for some people. Um, we were some people that were really keen on it. A map of CPAN, um, that's not as pearly as it sounds. They're looking at a, um, J, a jQuery um, information thing for it just to display the map. Um, Davikel and Akel, um, Andrew McMillan, who was a, has been a Catalyst director, um, has his own company and he's working on calendaring stuff. So last year they were working on the actual Davikel server itself, and this year they're working on the, the Android app for the calendar. Challenges. Oh my god. <sighs> Different levels of knowledge. The academy students, um, they come from different backgrounds, different knowledge. Some people have um, a lot of programming knowledge and they have a lot of knowledge in other systems. Um, we have people who have trouble adapting to GIMP and prefer to use Photoshop, um, not being able to adapt to those tools. Um, we have people who their first time programming in any sort. And the motivation with it as well. A lot of students um, are quite motivated to learn. They'll, once their session is finished, they're going to carry on for another half hour, an hour, trying to finish what they're actually trying to do. December is not a good time to coordinate people. I'm sure the um, LCA organisers are probably sort of thinking the same thing. Problem with um, December is, you know, people want to go on leave. Um, they want to think that um, when the academy starts on the 9th, that they'll be able to be pop in and, you know, be ready to go. I like to think that they would have been ready to go before they went on holiday. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time that um, this year we had some extra fun that the aircon in the building was being upgraded which means we're moving people between floors. So setting up for the academy was um, a bit of a challenge as we were trying to get that, get that happening. Yes, um, and there was, oh yes, sorry. And last year, I mean, aircon was mentioned last year because uh, the aircon was noisy. So we had a lot of trouble with um, temperature control and noise control. <laughs> being able to um, hear what people are saying and making sure people are comfortable while they're trying to learn things. <sighs> Rewards. From a um, rewards point of view, part of getting advertising happening spreading the word of open source technologies. It's an important part. We get students that are coming through that are learning about open source technologies and they're going away hopefully with an idea on what they are and hopefully they're going to be able to follow up and learn a little bit more about it later. Um, more academies. I know we noticed that this year there are two more sort of summer school type academies happening in New Zealand because, we, we hope, because of what we did with open source technologies. So we had people um, from Christchurch, we had two, three people from Christchurch come up for the academy this year, and one from Auckland, one from Napier. So the word has spread quite well. And I suppose, to me, the biggest thing is being able to watch students and people make, get things working. If you're a teacher or a parent and um, being able to see a child or someone suddenly, ah, that makes sense, or carry on working until they actually have something working and a look of satisfaction and happiness on their face because it is working. So, this is not good. <laughs> um, possibilities. So, 
This presentation was originally planned uh, when I did a similar thing for the um, New Zealand Computer Society when we were looking at the possibility of doing it in 2012. So the next possibility is when we're going to do 2013, 14, 15 and going on with that. One of the things that has happened is that we've had teachers and parents and other people that are loosely associated with the academy saying, how come we never got to do this at school? Parents saying, when are you running one for the parents? Teachers saying, can you do something for our school? And so we have a lot of possibilities in with that. I mean, one of the unfortunate problems is that our staff who are doing the tutorials, doing the teaching, running the projects, have a um, full-time job they're doing as well. We've got to get some billable hours out of them. And um, it does make it a little bit harder to get them teaching as well. So, you know, running a weekend course, running regular weeknight courses, doing it for teachers, project focused. The idea of thinking, okay, there's a project, someone has a, let's use Koha as an example. The, um, a bunch of people want to learn some development for Koha, so we can take the academy, take the idea of teaching them the basic tools, but all the, tool, all the project is all around how those tools work with Koha, for example. I mean, that has potential to be a money spinner, I suppose. The possibilities that go with it are absolutely endless. Um, so somewhere along the line, I'm going to tell you a little story and then explain why. Um, Git. I should have had my presentation in Git. The Computer Society one was somehow written over. And um, it seems that a bunch of slides have gone missing. And I was busy trying to rewrite it and check timing. And unfortunately, I seem to have failed quite well with the timing. <laughs> so I'm actually going to have to um, probably bring it up so that we try and encourage more questions than um, was originally planned. That's why I do prefer to do things anyway. So I actually do want to um, get people asking questions, pretty please, so I don't, we can make this session last. The, yes? Um, how Just much you, oh, sorry. Uh, how much are you charging, or is it sponsored by, by Catalyst? The question was, how much are we charging? We're not. We are actually giving the students a grant to come along and do this. Um, part of that is, once again, we are, Catalyst does have a massive commitment into open source. We want to be able to grow the community, we want to be able to grow the potential employees, not just for us, but for other businesses. And you know, school, if we want to get the motivated, interested students, um, the motivated, interested students, probably also the type that may have a holiday job. And you know, give up two weeks of holiday work for nothing. Um, having a grant to give to the students is um, a focus of it. Um, do you have like a kit that we can grab and do it ourselves? Do we have a kit? Not yet. Can I steal the name? Uh, you probably can't steal the Catalyst part of the name. Um, but we actually we do encourage other people to um, build their own academy. You may be able to find a d different way of doing it. Uh, if you catch me after, I, we can, I can talk a little bit more detail about what we've done and how we've done it. The stuff that probably should have been padding out the slides a little bit more. <laughs> well, I might actually actually jump back through some of the slides if we got to have some more questions that are related to some of the slides. And what sort of feedback have you got from the students? Okay, feedback. And what sort of feedback have we got? Um, one of the things we'll be doing better this year is following up from the students. We probably will, actually no, it's not probably at all, we were lax about following up with the students. Um, I know that I bumped into one of them at the gym and he said he had first year at university and it was a struggle and so he didn't carry on with some of the stuff he had hoped to. The um, feedback has been relatively positive. Um, the we, are, we do have, there are some people, as I said, I think with motivation for doing things, um, adaptability. Um, some people are probably less enthused as we try and get them to use a different tool that they're not used to using. Uh, yeah, so this year we will be we will be following up a little bit more on 
what they've done and how they how they felt about it. But on the whole, the feedback we have received has been positive. There haven't been too many negative things, um, but you know we take from those. Room layout was an important thing we had. Um, the original layout of our rooms was sort of trying to create a work environment so they're co not coming in and they're not feeling like they're at school anymore. They're actually working in a work environment. So we had the desks laid out in little pods like you'd find in an office maybe. And um, unfortunately that meant when people were watching slides they had their back to the computers, which is not such a bad thing really. You sit at the back and you see how many sessions of Facebook are running. I suppose it's pretty much like at a conference here. <laughs> you see people on Twitter, on Facebook, you know, not necessarily focused 100% on the slides. Um, and that, that does create a problem when you're teaching things, that you're trying to work through some bits and pieces, trying to build knowledge, and if people aren't focused when some of that key information happens, they're going to lose out on it, which is not good. Hi. Um, so I'm in my final year of uni, and studying, going from high school to uni, I find that a lot of people really have a lot of access to software and the ability to program because it is inherently free. You just have a computer. So people are confident in programming. Do you think this sort of thing would be worthwhile in designing hardware? Because, I mean, I'm in my final year of uni, and nobody can design a board or knows the basics of elect electronics because you have to actually purchase something and do something like, like that. So do you think this could relate to an open hardware system? So, just for the record, um, could the academy be used to teach a open hardware? Yep. Yes, that's the answer. Um, we have looked, um, we do have some people on, at Catalyst who are interested in Arduino type stuff. So there was sort of some vague discussion that, oh, that'd be interesting to do next year. Um, but once again, it's like, we've got a week, we're trying to teach people. Uh, that's not going to work very well. So um, probably maybe we might consider the idea for ourselves that an extension past the academy to keep people keep in touch with people is add maybe a um, Arduino type thing and then maybe more hardware type stuff could be possible as well. But there's no reason why it wouldn't work for hardware as easy it works for software. Uh, cool. Um, so I have just come, as in just from yesterday, from the National Computer Science Summer School in, run by Sydney Uni, um, which has some similarities but not as strongly focused on open source. Um, okay. We find that we need a teacher to student ratio of one teacher for every four students. Um, and we usually have mostly uni students for tutors, just to cope with the, the difference of skill levels to keep the more advanced students um, interested and challenged and the newbie students um, learning programming for the first time. So what, how do you, how many teachers do you have at these all Catalyst employees? Have you considered <coughs> recruiting uni students as well? Um, teacher student ratios? Yes. Yeah, yep. Um, basically we have the tutor and we often, for some of the sessions we have maybe one or two additional people wandering around helping people out. Um, that was one of the challenges we did have, the, the difference between the people who know what they're doing and the people who don't know what they're doing. I think we found that people from one, from one school may be sitting next to another person from that same school and they may have done the same classes so they've got the same level of knowledge. I think when it comes to next year we will be getting people to um, try and pair up a little bit, someone who knows what they're doing, someone who doesn't know so much what they're doing, and get them to actually start working and helping with each other. I mean, the people who know what they're doing, one of the challenges will, for them would then be, how do I explain this to someone else? And if you've ever done something and then trying to explain it to someone else, you know that you're going to learn a lot more from doing that. And I know you've got one in Sydney. Um, are you looking to explain Band other places around Melbourne or have yeah, other periods, um, say Melbourne or Perth or wherever else in Australia or something like that? For, for, for this, this your, your academy, so two weeks, say I can do a workshop in Melbourne or in another, in another city somewhere around Australia? The academy is based in Wellington. Uh, that's where um, the majority of our, of our staff are. And uh, so we've only ever run it in Wellington. No, we haven't done it, no. Um, that introduction about Catalyst was just more, I suppose, a description of Catalyst. The, it would be good to see it happen more, and um, I think 
if anyone was really interested in running it, that um, we would definitely be able to help provide some guidance to be able to make sure you can get that kicked off and running. But yeah, only Wellington so far. Very much along the same line, are you looking at offering the workshops remotely? Yes, we are working out how we can do that. I mean, when you're learning stuff, the hands-on someone sitting over your shoulder does help a lot, especially when you've got a small problem. Working remotely does require a little bit more motivation from the student to be able to do that. Um, the Using Moodle, we hope to be able to use Moodle to be able to do that. Yep. That was your next question, was it? <laughs> so yeah, working remotely, if we can get that out to the students, we want to do that. What we want to be able to do actually is to be able to, in the lead up to it, is to, for the people who haven't done anything before, if we can get them to do some little bit of pre-study that we can set for them, so that when they get into it, they at least have a little bit of understanding, a small bit of understanding that we've been able to kickstart in little exercises for them to start. Yeah, I suppose we could do. Um, you can still have that um, interaction and conversation and, and ask the, the people within the workshop um, questions and stuff. So it's, yep. so it's real time. So the question, just to catch up for the camera, Sorry. is um, would Hangouts or something like that be useful? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's technology that we haven't actually looked at from that point of view. It'd be interesting to see how it goes. Um, if anyone's keen to try and let us know, it'd be good. <laughs> um, so, uh, correct me if I was wrong, but it seemed like you were uh, providing virtual services and virtual hosts for people to do stuff on. Yes. Does that mean that they were um, going away without access to Linux or anything on their, their laptop? Like. Like most of the stuff that, that I do, I try to give away like a live CD or a, a boot CD or something so that they can essentially continue hacking on stuff when they're at home. Yes. The, the first year, what we do is we give them a, 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 a CD because, you know, an Ubuntu CD is something you can give away to people. You can burn it and give it away without a problem. The virtual servers, the first year, as I said, we didn't have an externally accessible virtual server for them to use. Um, this year we used Where's My Server? Um, to provide some virtual machines that they have access to. They can SSH into it from the, lap the laptops we gave, we allowed them to use. They're not given away, unfortunately. Um, and some people have Linux machines at home that they're trying to use to connect and going through the same process. Some people have Windows, some people have Mac. Um, you know, we've t pointed them in the right direction of how to install, for example, um, VMware or virtual PC to install Ubuntu so they can access it that way. Um, it'll be interesting to follow up on that, how many people actually use those servers ongoing, to see actually how many people are carrying on working, playing with the tools, toys. Question and answer sessions are great, aren't they? What's the situation like with using free software in schools in New Zealand? I, mean, I know in Australia we're, we're fairly tightly locked down in our schools about what software can be on the computers, and it's, it's difficult if you go in and want to teach them something, the IT gets in the way. How did, did you, how did that work in schools? Um, there are some schools that treat, sorry, open source in schools. <laughs> uh, Albany Senior High School in Auckland is a new high school that has, um, that has a lot of focus on using some open source technologies. Um, there are some schools that have an interest in, in teaching it. I know that one of the head of technology at one of the Wellington schools um, came along to as part of the interviews. Um, he wanted to be involved sitting at the back of the room this year, um, wasn't able to, so we'll be touching base with him afterwards and finding out how what we're doing fits in with the syllabus. And I mean, ultimately, if we can get schools to work within the exact syllabus they have to and use open source tools as part of it, um, that's what we'll try and do as well. And that goes back to the possibilities of getting teachers involved um, yeah, but same thing, you know, a school's going to get bulk licences from Microsoft and sit on the machines and, you know, I think there is still a move away from um, IT in schools being how to use a word processor. 
and um, the more we can actually turn it into more of a computer science is what is being taught in schools, the better. Um, it's getting to a point where people know how to use a word processor anyway. It's, it's a lot more generic than it used to be. It used to be technology, computers in schools were for the people that had their computer at home and yeah, there were few and far between of those. Mm. Ian's example of Albany Senior High School is a, a really good one. Some of the students from Albany Senior High came and spoke at LinuxConf in Brisbane last year. Um, and the, the school has gone completely open source. Uh, it's got a very open approach to education with open spaces rather than classrooms. So it's, it's quite a fascinating uh, educational experiment that's, that's going on there. And there's plenty of information about it. Uh, on, on the net if you, if you want to look for that. Ian, uh, my, my question is um, in relation to the age of the students that you're bringing into the academy. I, I guess by taking them out of years 12 and 13, you're um, perhaps hoping to influence the post-school study choices that they, they might make, uh, perhaps give them some information that uh, helps them to assess the various course offerings that they, they might be considering. Um, I wonder if you've considered um, getting uh, the opportunity to get the open source message across to um, people who are already working uh, on their courses in the university um, and perhaps uh, not, not getting the open source exposure that uh, that we might hope for, uh, would there be advantages in targeting students who are perhaps just that couple of years older and already, you know, getting more background information about, about the technology and bringing them into the academy? So the question is, should we be targeting university students as well? Um, yes, it would be good if we could. Um, we're not an educational institute ourselves. Um, we don't necessarily have the resources to be able to target universities. Universities should be t pushing that to those students. Um, uh, Dr. Brenda Chawner is um, School of Information Technology. She is a very keen um, open source person. So she's a, um, also a member of the Open Source Society. So yeah, we have, there are people who have the understanding of open source. And you know, I suppose it's you know, whether we're teaching people Microsoft Visual C++ or whatever is taught for programming in schools or whether we're trying to get them learning Perl in universities as a focus. But uh, yeah, definitely, we probably, I would think that it's a good thing to do, but from Catalyst's point of view, it's probably beyond the scope of what, what we're actually after. Um, if we can influence before they get to university, that's probably good. Mm. And actually just before, mentioned Albany Senior High School. Um, we had two people apply to come to the academy from Albany Senior High School. They um, withdrew because they're coming he they came here instead. Um, you mentioned an interview process. Yes. So that's for accepting the students? Yes. It's, it's just to check to make sure that we are getting the people that are useful. I mean, the, going from 10 to 17, sorry, interview process, that going from the 10 to the 17 was that people came, we were after 10 because that was the size of our training room. Then we had 18 people apply, 17 people turned up for the interviews. Um, we couldn't find a reason to turn anyone down. And that's the thing, you know, if people come along and they can articulate that they're enthusiastic about learning, then we don't want to be turning people away for that. So it was a commitment check, essentially? Yes, yes, yep, okay. yep, yep. Any other questions? We're just about time for question time. Yes, it is. So now you've got to round out some more questions. Uh, just a question to see if you'd uh, thought about using the previous students in the next year to help um, educate the new students at all, like have a, sort of like a legacy sort of program for the previous uh, attendants. So you're talking about getting the previous years to help the second, the next year? Yeah. Um, no, we hadn't considered that. Um, although one of last year's students um, is working with us as part of the Summer of Tech. Um, so it's where university students come along as interns at companies and do some 
work and development stuff. So one of the previous students is actually working part time, well, full time in between university years. Any other questions? Going? Going? Unless you'd like to talk some more about um, pat it out some more? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, it's, it's highly embarrassing that it went as quick as it did. Uh, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you said at the beginning that um, one of your goals of starting this academy was to promote more women in yes. um, open source and more women, I guess, in computer science in general. Um, uh, uh, what, like, this seems like a program that's just aimed at getting more high school students into open source. How have you been targeting women specifically? How we target women specifically um, was part what we did the first year was probably targeted better that we approached the girls schools first um, and then when we were looking a little bit shy on numbers we started going to the co-ed schools. I don't think for the first year we approached any boys only schools. Um, so we targeted the teachers to be able to push, promote that to the students. Uh, we had uh, Ruth McDavid who's one of the sort of very much a promotional person in Wellington doing a lot of stuff around com IT community. She um, was driving the um, push into the schools to see if we can get the students we needed. This year's intake, um, we approached the schools again, but um, I think we did less approaching people, and there was a lot of um, work by the teachers promoting it themselves or rem reminding them about it from the previous year. Cool? Oh, run, run, run. You could be all the way up. Thanks, Ian. I really enjoyed that presentation. How does the open source community help Catalyst IT? If, if you were to go to the community and say, this is what we need you to do, what would it be? <laughs> I'm just trying to work out how to paraphrase that question back. Um, how does the open source community help Catalyst in terms of the academy? open source community, thanks Rob, and say this is what we need from you to help make this bigger, better, more sustainable, etc. What could we do differently or how could we repackage some of the things that we do to make your job and the work of um, the Catalyst Academy easier? I think Catalyst has, I'll start, Catalyst has pretty much put all the effort into running the pre these two years. Uh, we haven't actually looked a lot going to the community for it. Um, part of that is we want to make sure that um, our staff are looking after running things. It is growing now. We, we had three tutors that were from external sources come in, although one of them is an ex-employee. <laughs> um, but I think part of the training, part of the um, Developing, developing course material would be the way to do it. If a, um, I don't know, let's pick a technology. Someone just pick a technology quickly. A, sorry? Yes. Git, cool. Um, if the Git community were to say, hey, we need to find a better way of teaching people how to use Git, and we're able to develop some basic steps of a progression of how to teach things, um, and the community was actually able to release that, then we could do that, use that information ourselves. Although we have taught Git ourselves to external organisations, um, we teach progress to people as well. Ah, sorry, Postgres. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I think next year we we have probably grown enough that we need to actually rely on or have to go to the community but more to get more information about what needs to be done. It's, if you're working on a project and you want to have people working with you, what do they need to know to be useful before they're actually, you know, yeah, making commits or doing insane things? So. 
I came in late, forgive me if you answered this at the beginning. Um, the, are you working with um, other educational organisations on, on developing that kind of low level curriculum or syllabus? Like, here's how to contribute to Open Source 101. Are we working with external organisations to develop the syllabus? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> we've looked at what we need people to be able to do, Catalyst needs people to be able to do, so we're making sure we've got those skills. Um, we have one of the principal, one of the head of technology people from one of the schools interested in working, knowing a little bit more about what we're doing and how we can work with them to give them the stuff, give them information and, and um, learning materials. Have you made that material, th your stuff, ignore external orgs, have you made your stuff available online somewhere so that... Not yet. Will you? Um, we hope to. We do plan need, to. Do you need help with that? Yes. <laughs> and we need someone to ask a question over there next. Um, more of a comment, um, the comment about um, contributing to Open Source 101 reminded me that a few years ago at Linux ConfAU there was a talk about um, a course, I think in Canberra at the university, that, which was basically, basically the same as yours, but it was a semester's course at university rather than a summer school for school children. Right. Trigger's master's unit? Trigger's master's unit? I, yeah, I've, I remember the talk, but it was a bit, it was a few years ago, so um, I don't know whether you and uh, Trich might coordinate somehow exchange experiences. Um, I think he's around at the conference. So oh, I've seen him about, yes. Yeah. Uh, that might be an interesting conversation. I think so, yeah, probably. <laughs> How many female tutors do you have? In the, this is, I'll go back to last year. Oops, no, that way. So in there, last year we had, um, Brenda, did a Brenda Wallace did a session on, in the freedom part about um, patents and copyright. And then Joe Clark did the My First Server. Then and she did PHP last year as well. And then this year, um, Brenda came back and did her freedom part. We had um, Dr. Brenda Trauner come in and do part of a session in there as well. Then Joe did my first server. Jen did the HTML CSS. Yes, that's it. Sorry, do you have anything, anything else? Uh, I was just going to mention um, there's a, um, uh, there is a collection of females at university level called Girl Geek Coffee, so if you want to actually resource potential tutors from there, yep. that might be an option. Part, part of the stuff that we've done so far has been um, resourcing internally, um, using our internal staff. And um, it's also the combination of having to find people willing to stand up in front of a class and teach people. Uh, we do have more knowledgeable people on staff at Catalyst who, could, who have the knowledge to be able to teach, but guys and girls, but they're generally, um, there's still that element of standing up in front of people to teach is a hard thing to do. But yes, getting more people externally come in. Um, probably I will I'll just touch base with you about afterwards about finding more about getting those girl geeks. Just to follow on from Miriam's question there, in your opinion, does having uh, tutors of both genders provide good role models for students, um, both male and female students, to enter the open source community? Gender balance and role models, yep. Um, yes, it should do. It should do. Um, if, if we're targeting girls trying to get them involved in technology and we have all male tutors, um, there's no role models there to say that the women can do much. 
Um, so we are trying to get um, the tutors involved, the women tutors involved, get them in there teaching. Um, yeah. Anything else? Any more? Any more? Still got another five minutes of question time, people. <laughs> What, where, where are you, what's the big picture of where you're hoping to take this? Like, you know, if, if, you know, everything worked as, you know, to the best it could possibly do, what's, what's the utopia that we're looking at? The utopia we're looking at with the academy. I think, I mean, some people have some personal opinion about where it could go. Um, our limitation is what we can do for ourselves. The next, no okay, no limitations, all possibilities, endless possibilities. It would be great to be able to get a, have a course or a block of information that can be taught by anyone, anywhere. Um, introducing it, technology, open source technologies to schools. And from there it's like, how many people can you fit in a room uh, yeah, being able to make it available for everyone to be able to teach and grow. So we're introducing open source at school level and then maybe earlier and earlier. Um, we're doing targeted um, the last two years, years 12 and 13, but we did have um, some younger people apply as well. And once again, if they're enthusiastic, it's hard to turn them away. Yes. Excellent. Along the same lines again, um, you mentioned um, one of the difficulties is dealing with the different levels of knowledge. Would you be considering breaking up the courses and having um, two sort of run parallel, one for uh, your higher knowledge and one for your lower knowledge bases? So splitting or streaming the classes? We have discussed that. Um, for us to be able to split it, it becomes a resourcing issue. Um, we have two weeks where we can do that for, for ourselves. Um, this is the second week of it. So last week was the first week, this is the second week. So yeah, January, I mean, that's the other possibility. Um, it also becomes to a point as, as we start doing more, we actually going to need to start looking for um, making sure we get external support and resourcing, especially if we're also giving them stu students grants for turning up as well. But uh, for streaming, yes, that big gap, being able to split the classes and run a PHP for beginners and a PHP for advanced, uh, that's two extra sessions, two extra tutors, that's a lot of breakdown. We are looking at how we... Not if you have the session, not if you have the session staggered then instead of parallel. Then if you say something that's... Yep. Uh, yeah, but then, I mean, if we stagger it, then we've still got two tutors working at once, running two different classes. Does that make sense? So if we run two different streams, we say, this lot are going to do PHP for beginners, um, while the PHP for advanced people go off and do something else. We've got those two streams, two different tutors, two different rooms. Oh, sorry, I'm with you, I'm with you. Um, the thing with that though is that if you run the advanced one and the not so advanced one, you've got people, because we're doing stuff with graphics as well, we've got some design oriented people who are interested in design, they may be more interested in design than they are in development. And so you've got, if you run them two weeks apart, you've got people who are low end on the development, but high end on the graphics, and are they going to go into, which one are they going to fit into? But, uh, so, the, I mean, for streaming, we are looking at how we can break the room up a little bit better. The tutorials were targeted, trying to aim at a base level with extension exercises so that people know what they're doing. Uh, but often you'll find that people don't put their hand up that they're bored, they're going to sit on Facebook instead. Well, I'll, I'll actually call the... Um, I'll call the questions to an end. Herculean effort. Thank you very much. Well, we are coming in to the end of the, uh, the time that we've been allocated for, for talks. So um, on behalf of the uh, organisers of LCA, here's a oh. small thank you gift and a, thank and you a card. And uh, if you'll join with me to... Uh
Well, thank you. I believe now is lunch, isn't it, Cathy?